Yeah, I'm talking about value chain. So um, value chains and their value in assessing value. How do you value your markets? Uh, that was the joke one. <laughs> Good one, right? <laughs> Thank you. I uh, look to be a value creator. Um, OK, so how it's sort of a, a, a mashup again of uh, what we covered earlier. I'm going to take this a little focused on Living Inc. and sort of the way that I look at value chain. So hopefully it's sort of an in-depth sort of let's bang it out and figure out what we're actually talking about when we talk about value chains and ecosystems, things like that. <clears throat> so what's the goal of today's lecture? I have uh, used this a couple times, and I love it. I don't know, anybody a uh, fan of the old school uh, South Park? Oh. Underpants gnome episode is amazing. So don't be an underpants gnome. And the, the point of the underpants gnome episode is that um, under, gnomes are stealing underpants. And they're making profit. And if you, you've never seen it, um, yeah, you can get these slides. Watch this video. It's a clip. It's a small one. But essentially what happens is the boys figure out that the gnomes are stealing underpants. And they take them to where they're collecting all the underpants. And there's a bunch of underpants gnomes. And they're collecting the underpants. And say, OK, so what's going on here? And they say, all right, step one, collect underpants. Step two, step three, profit. And the boys are like, what is this? And they're like, we don't know. We just know we collect underpants and collect profit. So don't be an underpants gnome. The whole point of all this mapping and the way that I really try to do, tell this story is that use the maps to collect the data to help you understand where you're trying to go. So when you're doing customer discovery, you're going to be drinking from a fire hose constantly, trying to figure out sort of where you're getting these insights. And the insights will be um, helping you put together these maps. And you can use these maps as sort of an anchor for all the content that you get, your knowledge about the market, right? I didn't know much about uh, Inc. until we started getting into the whole process and, and interviewing people and, and um, doing a lot of research, reading a lot of papers. But putting those maps together have been so huge. You know, people are like, what makes up ink? And it's like, well, colorants, okay? They can be inks or they can be, uh, excuse me, they can be dyes or they can be pigments. And I have to tell that whole story. Oh, there's a vehicle that carries the colorants around. And so being able to put together these maps of your understanding of a space is important. And how you're going to put those maps together is from the content that you get from customer discovery. So these can be sort of the anchors that help you, okay? So what are you trying to get out of it? Well, you get to build this network. And I think that's a really important thing. I know Rolodex is pretty, uh, right? It's LinkedIn connections, though. So that you have this Rolodex of people that you can actually say, hey, I need to understand X, Y, or Z, or I'm looking for an advisor. You know, we've found uh, essentially all our advisors on LinkedIn, um, which has been huge through connections of people that we've talked to. Um, establish relationships, right? is if you're going to actually have a partner in the industry that's going to help you get a product to somebody's hands from dirt, people want to interact, interact uh, with you often. Okay, You can't just call them up and say, hey, you want to be a, an advisor, and then say, yeah, sure. It doesn't usually ha happen that way. <laughs> and the biggest thing is you gain knowledge of the target industry. Okay, And you gain it, and you get to be versed in that language. And that's where you can start building these maps and acquire, keep a repository of all the content in these maps. So we talked about this, right? What's, what's the industry? Um, <clears throat> these maps can help you organize your understanding of the industry. And I think those are so critical because that gives you the ability to talk people's language. And if you call them up and you have no clue what you're talking about, they're not going to take you seriously. You guys do the same thing in your academic endeavors, right? You walk around a poster session and you find somebody who should be able to talk your language and they don't, what do you do? Whether you try to or not, you automatically discount them. So these are really important to help you keep an anchor on content. What do you think about early, in, in early interview strategies where you're with an industry expert and you're literally asking, hey, I'd love for you to map out for me how you think about the industry. Yeah. Do you think the important players are and how, they, and how those players are? Yeah. And as you get, I, I think it's a great idea. You know, you can start doing, they call it secondary market analysis, right? Where you're just wandering around online, looking at things, trying to understand, watching videos about, 
you know, uh, how it's made, those um, um, shows. But then, yeah, asking these people, you know, I mean, you got to have a little uh, humility to say, I don't know exactly what I'm talking about. The maps, though, can also help you further iterate on those maps. You can show those to people and say, what am I missing? And I'll show you a couple examples here of things that I think were super big aha moments for us at Living Inc. that were built because of these maps, I mean, that were uh, attained because of these maps. So let's take a look at it. So we're in the pigment industry, right? There's ways to learn about the pigment industry. Ibis World are, whoops, wrong button. Our uh, industry reports that are really valuable. CU, I know, has subscriptions to some pretty big databases. CSU has these same subscriptions. So if you're from CSU, call me up. I will get you some good industry reports that you can flip through. They're not going to give you all the information, but they give you context. CU, I'm sure, does the same thing. Sally, right? Yep. OK, great. Yes. Um, so. We're di diving down further and further into these market verticals, right? So we go from pigments into paints and coatings. So you can see paints and coatings down here. What else can we use pigments for? Plastic. So we're taking a look at all the different markets that we may be into, all the different customers that we may actually be able to talk about, right? <laughs> and now we're into flexographic ink. So this is where Living Ink lives right now, is in ink, flexographic ink. So it's a type of ink in the market, right? So when I say we make ink, the people who know ink say, what type? Can you do offset? At first, I was like, yeah, what? Maybe. I don't know. That's OK. But we've tried almost all of these types of inks. We know how digital inks function different than flexographic. And there's a reason that we're in this market vertical. It's because the product attributes that we have fit this much better than they fit this space for right now. But this is a growing market, so we're targeting trying to get there, right? And so trying to understand all of this, <coughs> and there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it, and ways you can divide the market. But this gives you context to build these maps, OK? And how do you become first in these industries? Yay, mapping via customer discovery. So you guys have seen this already. This is my map of the flexographic ink market. And you can see how, I mean, I literally had no, oops, I had no idea the difference between a pigment and a dye and why there was something called a vehicle here. But figuring out how ink is made has been huge for us to be able to tell this story, okay? And so this is sort of gonna be, you're gonna see this a lot over the next couple minutes. And I might actually wrap up early. So it allows you to know the steps in the process. Right? So my story from the living and greeting card of dirt to customer hand, we didn't even think about that and what we were doing. We didn't even map that out before we got 1,000 customers. We got 1,000 customers and we're like, holy crap, what did we just do? Right? Who gains value through the process? Okay? So where are the steps in the process that add value to the product? So refining something. So when we talk about uh, um, carbon black, Somebody has to pull that out of the ground, right? They add value to the product where it was inaccessible. Now they got it in their hands. Somebody's going to take that and refine it. There's another step in the process that adds value, right? And that's what we're getting um, to. So who all the players are in the process and who you may or need to want to partner with in the process. Because if you think you're going to do it all, you either got a very simple uh, uh, value chain or you're delusional. So let's start with materials flow. So how do things move through this process? So this is all tangible material. This is the way I like to start these things, where it's tangible, actual product, right? So I take a raw material, I turn it into a finished pigment, right? I turn it into a dispersion, which is a mix of pigment and goo. I take the raw material vehicles, I turn that into something. I mix these two and I have an ink, right? Now I got a lot of ink. Now I have the printed product. So it's the tangible things that you can place down on that that help you sort of say where are the steps. And the I and all of that could be anybody. It doesn't have to be Steve. Yeah, it is just, it's, it's, it's living ink agnostic, right? It's me saying, OK, so if we were going to take it from dirt to customer hands, what are all the things that we're going to have to do, right? So this is a great example, OK? Raw material, it's not a pigment. Somebody has to process this to turn it into a finished pigment. Add value, right? It's more valuable from step one to step two. 
Yes? OK. And so uh, I'll start talking about value chain. Just like I said, right? When you add value to the product, who's actually adding the value? And this is where you can start putting the value chain concept onto there, OK? The activities needed to create a product or service. And I highlighted add value, the processor activities that add value to an uh, article, so raw material. I've seen a multitude of battery companies, anode companies, <laughs> where they say, I make a perfect anode, and I want to be a battery company. And I say, OK, so you want to be a battery company, do you? Where are you going to get lithium if you're a lithium ion battery company? And they say, I don't know, from a lithium mine? Lithium is, is a pretty uh, difficult material to work with, get the hold of, find, right? And so should they partner with somebody who actually has the ability to pull lithium out of the ground, right? Add value to the value chain. So it's just these steps, right? And they're like, no, I don't want to pull lithium out of the ground, right? So you're going to go find a partner that does it for you, right? And so starting to understand what chunks of the value chain you want to bite off is going to be really critical because production, formulating, marketing, after sales service. One of the things we learned about um, Kickstarter when we did our Kickstarter was that dealing with the postal service is first a, pain, a giant pain in the ass, uh, especially around the world, all the different postal services and how you actually move a product from US jurisdiction to Canadian jurisdiction to Finland and Czech Republic to China, wherever. We made that mistake of sending it all over the world. But when you send a product that can't be crushed to Australia and it gets crushed, what happens? Is that person picks up the phone call, I mean the phone, and calls Living Inc. and says, hey, somebody take care of my stuff. After sales service, do you want to do that? Scott was doing that. Okay, sorry, I'll send you another one. It took time. Do you want to actually be doing that stuff? And so you can start to, in the value chain, start to assign yourself things you want to do. I talked about this. Critical partners that you want, right? Do you want somebody managing your customer service? If they have something that establishes, it's much easier than you doing it, right? Um, where you should focus your efforts. Where are you best at? So that, um, that uh, battery company, the anode company, they were best at making anodes. So should they make a whole battery? Do they even know the steps in making a whole battery? Shouldn't they find a partner who makes a battery and say, you know what, you want our anode, don't you? And that battery company who has figured out how to source lithium, figured out how to package it, figured out how to do all these different pieces can say, yes, let's share in the value, right? Um, and then how do you communicate what you do? Because if you say you eat the whole thing, most people are going to say, well, how many are you? And if you're like, well, I'm a team of three, they're going to say, so you're going to do the whole process, and there's three of you. I'm going to go find somebody who's more, uh, less delusional, right? So you can actually start saying to people, I understand my swim lane, right? I understand what I do well. I understand what I don't do well. And I'm looking for partners to help me with what I don't do well. And that's the way I really like to think about value chain. And so what I, what I did here is you can see, so we got the materials, right? We got the ing, the action words, the verbs, processing, milling, processing, testing, formulating, scaling, delivering, printing, troubleshooting, all of these different things that you have to do to transform one thing into another thing that's more valuable. And so you can see how you can actually start building this where it starts to make sense, right? So for the data folks, raw data, process data, right? What do you have to do to take raw data and process it? That's a lot of the value that you are saying you're going to provide as a company, correct? That's huge. Because raw data, we know, everybody who's ever worked with a pile of data says, dear God, how do I do this? And that's where you guys walk in. So you can do this even if it's not a tangible thing. It's the ways you take something and refine it and make it more valuable. <clears throat> 
Oh, okay. So here are uh, a couple other things that I wanted to add in here. All the players in the process and who you may need to partner with. So now I've actually put the names of folks that do stuff like this. Okay? And so you can start saying, well, if I'm going to sell a food contact ink, what is going to stop me from doing that? USDA. Regulators, food contact regulators, right? And you can start saying, oh, I know all of the different steps in the process and why from going here to here with a food contact ink and getting through these guys, I've actually made it more valuable, right? Increasing the value of the product through the value chain. This is a great example. So ink broker or ink distributor. We never knew that you needed an ink broker or ink distributor until we got into China. And group that printed said, we want to print with your stuff. We said, OK, all right. And they said, go talk to this guy, because that's the only person we go through. And I was like, cool, who's that guy? And they're like, well, he's the broker. So you have to deal with him. And I was like, oh, ha, we've been missing a step, haven't we? So now we've got to develop a relationship with an ink broker and distributor. One of our printers in the US will actually do that for us, because he's so jazzed about what we do. He says, I don't print those things, but I know some printers that do. Let me connect you with them. And so you start to see all of these different things that have to happen. Another thing that we thought was really interesting, we never thought about. We said, oh, you give it to the printer, they print it. <laughs> Inks are very dynamic liquids. There are tons of different types of printers. There are tons of different types of environments that you print in, right? You print in the high plains here. It's very different than printing in Cleveland because of the humidity. Right? And so the inks act very differently. So at these giant print houses, they call them uh, uh, converters, these giant converters that print for huge companies, the ink company literally has an employee who is on site. So that ink company has to spend $100,000 per year per big print house just to have an employee there that says, yep, you guys are printing? Yep, the ink looks good today. I'm going to go back to my office. Or, oh, so it's too sticky today because of the humidity? Well, let me check it. OK, add this. And we were saying, OK, so are we going to become an ink company? I don't think we can do that if we have to do that right now, right? So we got to partner with an ink company. <laughs> and this is sort of the, this is um, my crowning achievement as of late, <laughs> is putting all of the different groups that do all of these different steps, okay? It's not exhaustive, it definitely is not exhaustive. But as you start calling companies, you can start putting this stuff on here to say, ah, okay. So now I know all the different people that play the parts in making this product more valuable than the last step, right? <laughs> You'll notice that Living Inc. isn't on here. This is just me assessing the market for this one vertical, okay? Now, where do we go in the value chain? And how do you relate that to your own company? And this is where I take it next. Can you go back just a second? Sure. Nice big juicy nap. This is what we're talking about. He picked an industry, he laid out the stakeholders, he traced the flow of materials through it. I bet you traced the flow of dollars through it because you know the difference between 0.02 cents and 0.06 cents. Yep. I bet you, you, you trace some of the information flow, like what does the ink chemist need to know and what does the broker need to know, yep. et cetera, et cetera. And he actually put not just the general category of the players, but the company names into these various spots. That's what we're talking about when we talk about an industry ecosystem. And he did it for one piece of the ink industry. Yeah. It's not. It's so ecosystem. Yep. So it's not easy, right? I mean, it takes a long time. But the clarity that you get in doing something like this, and this is the accumulation of a ton of time and a ton of work and a ton of calling people, where you should see this. I have this, this uh, PowerPoint deck that's got like 200 slides because it's all the different iterations that I have of this. It drives Scott absolutely up a wall and be like, hey, I want to talk about ecosystem. Be like, what well, slide? It's 58 today. And so we'll go to 58 and we'll talk about it. But that was where I sort of vomited all of my content from all of my customer interviews on. And now I got this one document where I'm like, oh, goody, goody. I can go and look at the difference between the cosmetics market and the Flexo Inc. market, right? So, okay. 
So where do you fit? Where does your company fit? And this is the part that you can now do if you have this map. And what you guys are gonna try to do is really start to build these, right? And so if we take a look at the black flexographic value chain for Living Ink, when we were producing this, we were printing these in the house on screen print material. Look at where we are. Everywhere. We're everywhere. This is the exact same thing that we did with the Living Ink cards. But we knew very quickly that the only reason we were doing this was to get these prints. And I am a big believer that these helped us get that phase two SBIR because they said, you guys are actually trying this out. You have something you can give to a customer and the customer can say, that's pretty cool, right? Um, it wasn't, of course, all that. We did a lot of science and did some fun stuff, but captured the whole chain. Do we wanna capture the whole chain? Definitely not. No, no thank you. In some instances, could we make this a lifestyle company? Could I sit there and make cards and maybe make a living? Sure, maybe me and Scott, maybe, right? But, mm. so what does it look like when we started actually finding printers to print with, right? You saw those boxes when we started doing that. Look at the way we've decreased our touch points. We've had to share value because we gave up some of the value chain, but these guys have done things for us that we'd never be able to do. We're never gonna go out and buy a $50,000 printer just to do this, right? And so you can see we're still doing all of these things, but we've reduced our footprint on the value chain. <coughs> Dispersions are essentially a mix of pigments that go into an ink. The cool thing is, is that they can go into the plastic. So look at the trim around this table. It's black. It's not painted. It's black. You cut it, it's black. So what they do when they form that plastic is they pour a bunch of dispersion in there. Same thing with ink. Same thing with flexo, inkjet, litho, offset, right? Rubber, the rubber in your wheels. Uh, uh, in your tires, right? The rubber that's in the, in the car itself, all of that is colored. And so our flexographic, I mean, excuse me, our dispersion can actually go into all those things. And so if we just pull back and say we're a dispersion company now, look, all we're capturing is here. Is that enough? If we go into multiple markets, we think so. And that gives us the ability to do this. I was talking about ink before. Ink companies will have 10,000 SKUs. We have two. To become a functional ink company, we have to literally come up with hundreds of SKUs of product and then fly people around to troubleshoot ink. Do we want to do those things? Not right now. Maybe at some point in time in the future, but what we want to do is get good at something. So somebody says, you guys have a ton of value because you're really good at one specific thing and you know your swim lane, right? And so that's the game of value prop, in my opinion, is figuring out how you do certain things in the ecosystem and then who you partner with. So right now, we're working on a partnership with Sun Chemical and DIC. We've been hanging out with a lot of folks from INX, setting that up as well. So hopefully, if this doesn't go through, this does. If this doesn't go through, there's other groups. You saw them on the list, right? But the great thing is, is if they make our ink, Living Ink Inc., they're gonna do this because they already have those people in those, in those uh, facilities, right? So we don't have to hire somebody to go work there. So uh, another one that I pulled off here is um, cosmetics. So cosmetics companies wanna print with us to package. Great, then they're like, hold on, <laughs> you have carbon black that doesn't have any uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons in it. Could we use that in our eyeliner and mascara? That's where a dispersion can go as well. So this was an earlier version. We are working on trying to uh, 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 develop uh, stronger relationships with L'Oreal and Unilever. Yes. Yep, and human contact regulators, so in the FDA. So yes, but a harder market. But the margins are killer in this space, right? Compared to printing on a box. And so does it warrant all the extra work that we'd need to do to work through these groups to get to this? Um, 
Yeah, it does. And it depends on how much we can make and if we can validate the concept, right? So there, there's the game, right? Is figuring out how, you can see how this looks different than my ink flexographic ink uh, um, workflow, right? It's not a ton different. <laughs> But you know why? It's probably because I don't know as much about the cosmetics market as I do about the flexographic ink market, right? So, but it is different. My point is it is different. And you guys really have to try to hone in on one. You may pivot. It's painful. But this is how I think you survive in this space. So um, some really quick take homes. It isn't easy. Version 1 sucks. Version 2 sucks. Version 3 sucks. They all suck. They're going to le suck less each time you do it, okay? Suck and, less over time. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, that, I mean, yeah, I've, I have a ton of versions of this thing where it's just, it's been frustrating, but now that I'm at that sort of full flexographic ink workflow, value chain, and ecosystem, it feels good to be there because now I have some, some good stuff to talk about. It adds clarity. For me, I'm a very, very visual learner, so I need the the sticky notes, I need the workflows because it allows me to say, all right, so I can tell you about the things upstream, I can tell you about the things downstream. And it supports a story. So you can tell a story because you guys are just constantly gonna be telling stories about your company, about your process, and you need as much ammo as possible. And I think having these types of maps really helps you be able to be very nimble in your, in your conversations about what you do, who you add value to, why you need certain partners, why you need money, where you're going to use it, and so on and so forth. So just a really couple, a couple quick examples of some, some past folks that have done this. This was version one of their uh, um, ecosystem. This is what it looked like as they got through the um, interviews as they did interviews. So not the cleanest thing in the world, but these guys had, look at, look at the difference, right? They're starting to really understand this process and how they work through it. Second one, <coughs> very simplistic, right? Look, they do their consulting and, and everything else comes out of it compared to this. They're starting to actually say, I understand who I have to go through to get into a certain market. and so. It's not going to look pretty at first, but it does get better. And remember, uh, uh, remember the different roles people can play. And that, that's a tough one. It's, it's hard to define at times. But recognize the people that play the different roles, and it'll help. It'll help clarify. So I think that's it. Oh, no. Um, the jargon, we talked about this, know the jargon. So those IBIS reports have this jargon and glossary at the back of each report. And it's really cool to be able to see, right? So rub resistance. I know what rub resistance is now. We actually know who to talk to to test for rub resistance. So when an ink company says, what's the rub resistance of your ink? I can tell them, right? Um, tackiness. So it's just all the definitions. So then now what uh, I think would be valuable, and you guys add what you need to, um, is to jump back in and try to go through that process. Try to full, pull the tangible steps in the process, then the things you have to do, and who does them, and you start just building this map. And the one thing I would say is do it with sticky notes so you can move them around. Try to pick different colors for different things. If it's a tangible product, make it one color. If it's an action, Make it another. If it's a, a group, a person, a, a, a role, you could have a third or just line them up. But then figure out how to capture that. Take a picture so that you can move it onto some sort of electronic form as you move forward. Sally? Do we put this on top of our ecosystem? Yeah. Yeah. So you basically should already have a bit of a sense of your industry segment, your stakeholders. Now we want you to go back to that and continue to work with is there a section of that stakeholder map, that ecosystem, where you know more about the workflow, where you think you belong, and flesh that out? Is there stuff so missing? You do not get far enough along. You need to add more, then put where you belong. But literally take that, you know, you have version one, as much as that was from before lunch. You've now since fed, been fed real food and more ideas. 
go ahead and add that next level of understanding to it. And with an eye towards really flagging the what do I know I don't know, right? When I look at this thing, I see big gaps in my understanding. Because that will then become the who do I need to talk to and what do I need to listen for, ask about and listen for in order to flesh out that part of my understanding. Yeah. So, you know, as, as Steve has said, that map that he's got, he didn't sit down and do that in 20 minutes. He didn't even do it in one eye for flash. He did it in four years, five years? Four. Four years. Three years. Of hard work. So, so recognize that this is now, you know, version 0.1a. Yeah. And you're going to end up with this becoming a whole library at some stage. And this is always a spot you can talk to people about, you know. So let me let me tell you what I know about the process of getting uh, something into the into the market, and tell me what I'm missing. Is not always a great way to sort of make sure that you're telling people you know that they have a lot of content, and you're trying to uh, understand that, right? I don't know a ton, but this is what I know. Help me learn more, and it gives them sort of this. Yeah, I'll help. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, yeah. You're trying to understand what I do. That's you want to solve my problems. All right. Any questions? Okay.